welcome to the 30th meeting in 2014 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Could I please remind everyone present to turn off any mobile phones or other electronic uh, tablets. Uh, before we move on to Agenda Item 1, I just want to inform the committee that Jamie Hepburn has resigned his membership of the Finance Committee following his appointment as Minister for Sport and Health Improvement. In the words of the First Minister yesterday, and I quote, Jamie Hepburn has performed exceptionally as a member of the Finance Committee. So I want to put on record the committee's thanks to Jamie for his hard work and contribution to the committee over recent years. As yet, his replacement is still to be decided. Our first item of business today is to continue consideration of the draft budget 2015-16. I therefore welcome to the meeting Liam MacArthur, MSP, a member of the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body, Paul Grice, a Chief Executive, and Derek Crawl, Head of Financial Resources, uh, here at the Scottish Parliament. The members have copies of the SPCB's budget proposals for 2015-16. I'd like to invite uh, Liam MacArthur to make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Can I just say that uh, the new Minister for Sport will be more than welcome back to his place in the Scottish Parliament football team uh, when his diary uh, permits. Um, just a few opening remarks. Um, I, I thank you for the opportunity to present the details uh, of our budget submission for 2015-16. Uh, this represents the fifth and final year of our five-year programme of savings, which set out to match the planned reductions in the Scottish budget over the term of the UK CSR. As the graph in the presiding officer's letter uh, demonstrates, we've successfully delivered uh, that programme of savings, and by the end of 2015-16, uh, we will have achieved an 11.1% real terms reduction in the SPCB's uh, budget compared to the 2010-11 uh, baseline. The profile of our annual budget reduction, as um, colleagues on the committee will be aware, is considerably steeper in the first uh, two years of the programme as we delivered the vast majority of our savings early. It levels off in the remaining three years, although it still shows a modest uh, ter uh, real terms saving. Looking ahead to the future challenges in setting out uh, our budget pro uh, proposals for next year, and particularly as we look ahead to the next session of the Parliament, we have already uh, actively responded to a number of emerging cost pressures, including the further tax powers arising from the 2012 Scotland Act uh, and the increasing level of outreach work to capitalise on the public engagement uh, around the referendum. However, we are clearly not yet in a position to reflect on potential budgetary pressures which may arise uh, from the Smith Commission's proposals and subsequent legislation uh, in our longer-term forecast, and we would therefore aim to update, update the Finance Committee uh, on that when we return uh, next year. For now, perhaps let me draw on a, a few thoughts on some of the key elements of the figures uh, for this year. In terms of project expenditure, the corporate body takes its responsibility seriously to ensure that we maintain and replace our assets properly and that we invest in improvements to the Parliament's services and facilities. Examples of this in 2015-16 uh, uh, submission include the Digital Parliament programme to develop and support the effective use of digital technology, uh, planned expenditure on the 25-year maintenance plan for the building, uh, improvements to roof access and other changes to make best use of the building, uh, as well as planned replacement of some of the IT equipment. Turning to the issue of pay, our budget submission for pay is based on a continuation of the tight pay restraint we've shown in recent years. This is important because uh, pay for SPCB staff members and uh, member staff accounts for around 61% of our overall budget. Our current two-year pay deal for SPCB staff ends in March next year. We have not yet commenced negotiations with the trade unions on the 2015-16 pay uh, uh, proposal, but for budgetary purposes we are assuming a modest increase in line with other public sector pay increases. Uh, MSP pay increased by 1% this year in line with the IPSA determination for MPs and will be directly linked to Scottish public sector pay rises with effect from April 2015 onwards. The corporate body has agreed to seek a resolution of Parliament to amend the Scottish Parliament salary scheme, replacing the current link to MPs' pay with a new mechanism which will directly link MSP salaries to future public sector pay rises in Scotland. Uh, finally, members' staff pay provision will be upgraded in, in April in line with the provision of the members' expenses scheme. 
If I turn now to the office holders, again, as members are aware, the SPCB is charged with the oversight of these bodies, and the Finance Committee has rightly taken a strong uh, interest in how we exercise that oversight in, in previous years. We also welcome the involvement of other committees in scrutinising aspects of the various office holders uh, which are not within our remit. And as a member of the Education Committee, we had a, a very useful session uh, in relation to the, the new powers coming to the Commissioner for uh, Children and Young People uh, last month. The 2015-16 budget submissions of the various bodies amount to 8.3 million, which is an increase of 1.6% uh, in cash terms compared to the equivalent 2014-15 budget. Uh, overall, the office holders' budget is 8.4% lower in cash terms than the baseline year of 2010-11, equivalent to a real terms reduction of 16.3%. You'll note from our budget bid that we have increased the central constituency for commissioners and ombudsmen uh, by £50,000. This is to make provision for the potential staff costs which may result from the additional powers conferred on the Commissioner for Children and Young People pending further work to establish the justification, which is very much the focus of the uh, consideration the Education Committee gave to this. Um, Finally, I would like to put on record uh, the corporate body's appreciation for the work done by the Chief Executive and his team in preparing the SPCB's 2015-16 budget submission. Uh, that concludes my opening remarks. I hope I've managed to convey a sense of the approach we've taken to the budget uh, for 2015-16 and the years that follow. And uh, Myself and my colleagues would be happy to answer any questions the committee has. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that, Liam. Um, as is normal, um, I'll start with some opening questions and then I'll open out the session to colleagues uh, around the table. I'll be no surprise that I'm going to obviously start with in terms of the revenue projects because clearly that's obviously uh, uh, um, the biggest um, area of increase in the year ahead. And you did actually cover that both in your report and in your opening statement. I'm just wondering if you can give us a wee bit more detail as to what the digital parliament programme entails. It says here development of infrastructure systems and services to facilitate effective digital working. I'm just uh, wonder if you can give us a wee bit more information about that will mean in, uh, on the ground, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right in, in, in pointing to that as perhaps being the, uh, the, the principal reason, but certainly not the only reason for the increase in, in that uh, budget line. Um, the Digital Parliament um, initiative is something that's been ongoing uh, now for a couple of years, although it's, it's, it's building up, I suppose, in its intensity. I think it reflects uh, a recognition of the different um, pressures and requirements um, placed on, on MSPs in terms of the way that they work, the way that they interact with constituents, uh, the way in which they carry out their, their, their work, both um, in, the, uh, in the constituency uh, as well as in the, in the parliament. Um, the, the, the notion that um, MSPs simply work from a settled base on, uh, uh, at all times, I think, has, has, has long since passed, and therefore I think the Parliament needs to um, reflect those, those changing needs. So some of it is around um, the equipment and infrastructure that's needed to, to, to facilitate that. Um, some of it uh, has to be around um, the, the, the training and skills development, again, that allows uh, MSPs to be supported in the, in the roles that they, they, they carry out. Um, I, I mean, I think maybe in terms of some of the specifics, I'd, I'd ask Paul to, to, to talk about them. But I think what we'll see is, is, is perhaps a, a, an intensification of this work um, as we as we go forward. I mean, it's certainly something where we're we're attempting to, to capture the the views of of, of MSPs. Um, uh, on, a, on a, a sort of ongoing basis to make sure that, that what's being put in place just genuinely represent um, their needs. And, th and those needs are going to vary very differently. I mean, I, I, I know for myself that I, I operate in a, in a different way digitally than, than some of my colleagues, and the same will be uh, the case in, in each group. So we need to make sure that whatever we're putting in place isn't simply um, pushing the envelope too far for, 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 for some M uh, MSPs, that it's, it's, it's allowing them to feel comfortable in the way that they they carry out their, we their work, but not inhibiting others who, who, who want to go further and, and, and are keen to, uh, to trial kind of new ways of working. But Paul, maybe you could add to that. Uh, thanks, Liam. Just a, a few examples. So there's the, what you might call behind the scenes uh, uh, investment about getting common data systems, which is really important, given that one of the underlying philosophies to digital is about um, trying to reuse the information more efficiently, so it's input less often, it's more consistent. For that, you need common data standards. 
Um, there's a business publications project which is enabling a shift to digital for our core uh, business publications. Uh, another example is a members portal, which we hope to be launching uh, within the next few weeks. In fact, we're briefing the corporate body on that uh, later on this morning. Um, digital meeting facilities, uh, that's upgrading the uh, meeting rooms with better digital capabilities. There's a whole range of uh, projects within the programme convener, and that really accounts for a, a big chunk of the spend that we're proposing for next year. We hope that investment will lead to, obviously, better services to members um, in the longer run. I think, I mean, this will be an ongoing <coughs> cost, but as, as, as you'll have noted, the indicative forecast for 2016-17 sees the it sees the figure fall from 3.9 uh, million back down to 2.2 million. So I think we'll see fluctuations in this. But but as, as Paul says, this is something we've committed to um, a, a couple of years back, and, and and we'll be looking to kind of um, uh, roll out increasingly over the years ahead. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Now, um, <clears throat> if we turn to the the issue of um, staff. Uh, Pay. I notice that in terms of staff-related costs, these are budgeted to increase by about 8.8% more than the current financial year. I'm just wondering if you can uh, talk us through that a wee bit. I think in, in relation to um, staff pay, obviously we we were in a position where agreement was reached to um, uh, to, to uh, keep a lid on that. We're, we're emerging from that and, and therefore there will be increased uh, costs resulting uh, resulting from it. Um, as I say, the uh, the negotiations um, with the the unions uh, for next year have yet to, to commence, but we're, we're we're building in an assumption of uh, of a modest uh, increase. Uh, we'll see something similar in relation to uh, MSPs pay. Um, uh, as I said, said in the opening remarks, um, the breaking the link with MPs pay is something that the, the, the corporate body is committed to, to bringing before Parliament for, for agreement on. Um, uh, so I think that that's probably the the, 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 uh, the general gist of why that figure's uh, going up. Well, it's not really staff, it's the related costs, you know, basically. Um, I was kind of asking about really, you know, it talks here about it's important to ensure that adequate budgets remain available for staff support and redeployment, particularly through training and new systems and job related skills. I'm just wondering why that's, there's been a significant increase in terms of the previous year in that particular budget line. Yeah. I'll let David take that one and I'll add anything necessary. Yeah. Um, the, the main increases in that line are around travel expenses and job related training. And part of it is down to, as we've reduced the number of staff in the Parliament over the past few years, there is a greater emphasis on training and redeploying staff to different areas. So part of it is is down to training in specialist areas, quite a lot around the web and social media, some of the new technologies. And on the travelling expenses side, there is more emphasis on travel out with the Parliament. So a lot of the Parliament's engagement activity mm. and Parliament days and other things uh, is, is putting up the cost slightly in that area. So hoping to encourage more of that, the Parliament meeting and the committee, committees meeting outside uh, Edinburgh. I, mean, I think uh, there's always been a balance there. I think um, quite understandably uh, in the early stages of this session in the Parliament, there was a, a recognition of um, some of the, uh, the wider messages about tightening budgets and, uh, and austerity. It, it was felt to be inappropriate for, for the Parliament to be um, uh, spending too heavily in this area, but but the underlying principles of the Parliament have always been about being accessible. A Parliament for for all of Scotland. It will surprise no one that is the the member for for Orkney. I, I very much applaud that uh, that endeavour. Um, but it will remain a balance. I mean, budgets um, are, are not going to uh, increase substantially, but we do, we do need to ensure that we're giving effect to that uh, that that, that, uh, that underlying uh, principle. Uh, that we are accessible, that um, we give an opportunity for, for, for people to engage directly with, uh, with parliamentarians and, and, uh, and officials within the parliament. And I think uh, we're, starting to, to, we're starting to see that through the parliament days, through the involvement of the committees. I think it's been done in a way that is perhaps um, uh, working more cleverly uh, with, uh, with the resources that we, that we have, that we try to bring together um, through those parliament days um, more of an impact in the areas that we're, that we're visiting, uh, rather than having uh, more sporadic ad hoc uh, meetings, all of which on their own you could stand up a justification for, but, but perhaps um, we're, uh, we're absorbing more resources as, as a result. I mean, one thing I was intrigued and delighted to, to see was that there's been a £906,000 uh, reduction 
in rates following, and I quote, last year's successful negotiation with the Lothian Assessor to secure a 19.6% reduction in the higher rate will value initial place in the Scottish Parliament by the 2010 rating revaluation. Now, from my rough figures, that tells me that there's still about £4 million a year, roughly, being paid in rates. So I'm just wondering if there's further scope for reduction in those rates, and indeed if there's any, um, you know, um, backdating of the rating reduction to 2010, given that the, it was... But to, to Paul, who carried out these uh, yes. slightly idiosyncratic uh, negotiations, I mean, you're right, um, it, it mm -hmm. is a sizeable uh, reduction. It um, was secured after, um, uh, I think, two or three years' worth of uh, negotiations through, through uh, uh, appeal. Uh, what the scope is to, to reduce that further, I, I wouldn't like to say, but, um, Paul, maybe you could comment on um, yeah, it was it was uh, actually backdated, um, and we we uh, returned the what you might like might call a windfall gain uh, back last year. So we handed that money back to the consolidated fund. Um, there's a, a, a periodic revaluation, I think, every five years or so, um, and there was a the significant proposed increase which we challenged, uh, ultimately successfully. So that convener accounts for the money we had to budget in a sense initially for the. Uh, amount claimed by the assessor, but ultimately um, they accepted our uh, strong contestion that that wasn't uh, appropriate. Um, I don't think there'll be a further opportunity until the next revaluation, and, and unfortunately it tends to be that they try to push it up and one's trying to resist that as opposed to opportunity to reduce it. Um, and you're right, your calculations are exactly right. It's just under four million still paid. Uh, but obviously against what the threat might be to push it closer to five million, we were pleased to secure that outcome. Um, I should actually pay the real credit, I think, goes to Derek Kroll and his team. I simply made the last phone call. Uh, the other 99% of the work was done uh, by the colleagues. But that, the reality is, however, that it still is a very substantial element of our spend, as you rightly say, nearly four million pounds a year. And I don't see any change in that um, over the medium term, I'm afraid. I wonder how that can be how they can justify charging that amount of rates on, it, on the Parliament? It, it's, it's, the problem is that this is a unique uh, facility. Normally, if it's a, a more commercial premises, there is a market, and uh, I think it's a reasonably straightforward process. Uh, with unique, unique iconic buildings uh, like this, it, it does come down to more a matter of judgment, which is why we actually challenged it, uh, ultimately successfully. But... Uh, it is difficult at the end of the day. Um, it, it's, it's done by professional property valuers. But there is no market um, for, for, uh, for, for us. There is no, uh, you can't look around Edinburgh and say, well, you know, other parliaments tend to uh, trade at this value. So I, I suspect uh, next time around it will be um, uh, a negotiation, I guess, of a similar amount. But we'll, we'll obviously take forward your comments to sort of strengthen our resolve when those negotiations come. Yes, well, we can go into that in further detail, and perhaps other colleagues will, will do so, but I will leave that for the moment, because uh, I want to move on to say one or two other things, and then uh, before I let colleagues uh, have an opportunity to ask the, their own questions. And uh, With regard to commissioners and ombudsmen, um, uh, we previously discussed with the SPCB the possible relocation of the commissioners to a single hub, and, um, you know, Liam... Um, last year said that uh, we're working with office holders to affect savings by reducing the number of properties in Edinburgh and we hoped that we could co-locate a number of offices in the government estate near Haymarket but unfortunately that was unable to be achieved. I'm just wondering if there's any further progress being made or likely to be made in that area. In terms of co-location, I mean, it, 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 it remains, um, I, I think, a, a, an objective of the corporate body to um, achieve that where we can. I think since last we spoke, um, there has been a move by the Children's Commissioner to larger but less expensive property within Edinburgh that also has scope for accommodating uh, others within it, and that's a, a, an agreement we've reached with the, uh, with the Commissioner. Um, uh, the, the reduction in, in offices, I think, um, over the last three, four years has, has been from seven to four, I yeah. think. Um, so there has been a reduction. Obviously, we've got the Information Commissioner in St Andrews. I think it's felt at this, at this point um, moving uh, the, uh, the Information Commissioner to premises in, in Edinburgh. 
uh, doesn't make uh, a lot of sense for, for a number of reasons. Um, so it, it's something we're continually on the lookout to try and achieve lease breaks and, and the like, provide the, the trigger that allows us to, to do that in a way that uh, releases savings, etc. Um, so it's, uh, as I say, it's, it's, it's constantly under review, but at the moment um, I don't think there are other uh, opportunities on the immediate horizon to, to, to achieve that. Okay, uh, and lastly, before I open out the, the session with the Deputy Convener to ask questions next, um, just to ask about office utilities. Um, obviously, MSP offices are one of the bugbears, as the, we've discussed this before, actually, in um, private and by email, uh, the issue of um, bills being um, set out. And by the time it gets through the process, you're already getting final demand letters, etc., from uh, certain organisations now. One colleague uh, yesterday, a, me a member of the Cabinet, in fact, um, told me that he got a, an offer from Scottish Water of a 10% reduction in his bill if he went by direct, paid by direct debit, which isn't really open to us. Now, I'm, I know that there are one or two issues in relation to this, but uh, clearly if we could get those kind of level of reductions, given a number of offices we have and given all the different utilities that we have, um, what scope is there for introducing such measures? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, um, before passing over to Paul, we'll cover the detail on this. I mean, obviously recognise the fact that, uh, I think largely through, through your efforts, convener, we have been able to make changes in terms of the, uh, the way in which uh, MSPs um, uh, utility bills are, are, are dealt with um, to extract better value for... Uh, MSPs, but the Parliament as a as a whole, uh, the issue you raise is is, is one that um, we've had an, a, an opportunity to discuss. Now, while there's a a concern in relation to to direct debits that's perhaps different from from standing orders, um, nevertheless, I, I think the arguments that are made about ensuring that we uh, continue to secure savings and, and and best value where we can are ones that um, very much coincide with with our aspirations as a as a corporate body, and I think. Paul has, has already had some initial thinking with his officials about how we might be able to, to achieve that. Yeah, I mean, as you know, convener from our correspondence, I, I think this is a really good idea, and I, I strongly support it. There are some technical hurdles we have to overcome. The principal one being that, unlike a standing order, a direct debit isn't for a defined amount of money, um, and to give um, a, a third party the right to take money directly from um, our account is obviously a risk we have to look at. Um, that said, I think the objective is well worth pursuing, uh, and I've got a team working on it, uh, and I hope to get back to you as soon as I can with some ideas on that. And I think uh, we previously corresponded on the idea of using Parliament-negotiated contracts and making them available to members, and I think that had an ultimately successful outcome with a significant number of members taking us up on that. So I think in that spirit, we're going to pursue this one. Say so there are real technical issues, but I I'm sincerely hoping there's nothing we can't overcome and I'd be uh, more than happy to come back to you on that as soon as I can and if necessary brief the wider committee. That, that would be very helpful, thank you. Okay, um, the first person to ask questions will be John to be followed by Michael. Uh, thanks convener, uh, thanks gentlemen. Um, I mean clearly you're making the point that uh, the budget reduction compared to 10-11 uh, has been quite uh, severe, large, whatever. Um, although it was mainly in the earlier years, so it's kind of evened out a bit more. So I'm just kind of wondering, um, I mean, has, have we coped with that? Has the building coped with that? I'm particularly interested in the kind of maintenance side of things, that we're not cutting too many corners. I think that's a very, a very fair question. Um, I, I, I think there was a process leading up to um, the, the decisions about uh, how this um, profiling of the budget would take place. And I think we're fairly confident that the strategic approach to that has meant that we've been able to uh, absorb those um, savings up front but, th but continue to make um, modest real-term uh, savings in the, in the kind of final three years. But, but I think painfully aware that we would not be thanked by anybody, um, not least MSPs, but, but, but the, 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 the wide variety of... of um, users of this this building were we to do it in a way that started to undermine uh, our effectiveness as a parliament and the way in which we we deal with the some three hundred and fifty thousand or so uh, visitors to this uh, to this parliament i I mean, each will have their own view, but I, I, I think as a corporate body we are confident that we've been able to achieve this in a way that is 
um, uh, ensure that MSPs, committees, Parliament, uh, parliamentary business is is supported in the way that it um, it, it needs to be supported. That actually we've been able to to take on board the, the, the new challenges, whether that's in terms of um, the move towards a more and digitally focused um, uh, parliament uh, uh, in terms of, of uh, adhering to our 25-year uh, maintenance plan, in terms of uh, adhering to the kind of routine checks and maintenance that are required uh, in between times. Uh, and, and I think, uh, I, I think therefore, the, the story is a, is a fairly positive one. Um, are, are there areas where we, we could have made um, deeper savings? Well, possibly, but I, I think we felt that uh, in, in, uh, were we to do so, there, that it, there would have been a, a, a quite serious risk of us not being able to, to continue to provide the, 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 the level and breadth of the service that, that MSPs and, and, and other building users has, have every right to expect. Okay. I mean, the, the convener mentioned in the list of uh, items that totalling the 3.9 uh, million, the digital parliament programme, which is the largest one, but I'm interested in some of the others that are in there. Uh, I mean, you make the point that uh, routine maintenance is separate from projects, so I kind of understand that. Uh, but I was just wondering if you could maybe comment on some of these other ones. I mean, a uh, replacement of chamber lighting at 400,000, I take it, is a little bit more than the light bulbs. Uh, and installation of restraint rail system to improve roof access. Now, I'm just wondering if that is really has been a fault from the beginning, because I mean, I would have thought something like that might have lasted a bit longer than the number of years that this parliament has been here. Let me let me take those um, in reverse order. And I think you're absolutely right in, in your observation in relation to the, to, to the latter. It, it was partly a, a design fault, but also an installation fault. Um, it emerged through uh, the the sorts of in, in investigations that are carried out on a, on a routine uh, fashion. Now, there were a number of ways we could have um, dealt with that. Um, we could have uh, incurred um, a series of ad hoc spend in order to get round the design and installation faults uh, in the in the roof access uh, system. But I think the corporate body felt that that would be a, a case of throwing good money after after bad and actually the the, the more sensible and prudent thing to do was to um, uh, to put in place a, a system for uh, roof access that was fit for purpose that addressed health and safety needs and, and recognized um, the, uh, the, the the frequency with which um, that access is is required now in terms of who bears the cost of that uh, obviously given um, that it, it, it emerged from a, a design and installation fault uh, at the time of the construction of the building um, we made fairly strenuous efforts to, to pursue that uh, through the companies involved. Uh, unfortunately, um, both uh, were insolvent and the opportunity to, to actually recoup that, that, that money was not, uh, was not possible. Um, so we were left, as I say, with the, uh, with the question as to whether or not we wanted to, to continue to put in place arrangements that would probably have done the job. Uh, but wouldn't have actually addressed the, 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 the fundamental problem. In relation to chamber lighting, um, I mean, as, as um, members will be aware, um, uh, partly in relation to our, um, uh, our, our uh, environmental um, uh, objectives and responsibilities, partly uh, in, in relation to the, the need to look at uh, making savings where we can. Uh, LED lighting has been installed in a number of different uh, parts of the building. Um, obviously, the chamber represents a, a, a different proposition, um, not least because of the, the, the broadcast nature of it, but it is uh, perhaps a, a more complex um, part of the building uh, to deal with as well. I think we're confident that um, the advances in, in the um, LED lighting technology allow us to, to, to look at progressing that. And what, what we will have, um, if this is, is successful, is a system where, uh, both in terms of the energy usage, but actually in terms of the, uh, the requirement for ongoing uh, maintenance and replacement, uh, th those costs will come down uh, markedly. So uh, again, it was a, it's a judgment that, that, that having done this in, uh, across a large part of the parliamentary estate, and there is an opportunity to look at the, the, the chamber. There are savings that can be uh, released from this, um, uh, but, but obviously it's, it, it's, it's a piece of work that, that um, uh, is, is relatively costly. I don't know if Paul has any other comments on those. No, simply to agree with your point, it's not just about relamping. It's a whole new system we're looking at. And as Liam said, uh, we very much expect <coughs> this um, to both uh, release running cost savings in terms of less electricity use, but it's 
as you, you will know, as people who occupy the chamber, replacing the lamps there requires the building of scaffolding. Um, and LED lighting just lasts a lot, lot longer. I mean, you know, five, ten times the length of time. So apart from the environmental benefits, uh, you have a significant uh, reduction in ongoing maintenance. So we think this is an investment that's worth making at this stage. Right, so there's actually quite a difference there between, I mean, obviously the roof, that's just a one-off cost, that's, that's gone eh, when you do these things. But when you do the lighting, there's actually quite a big kickback by way of savings from the way that you're, you're speaking, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I, in terms of what the level of that um, saving is, um, I mean, we can we can probably come up with um, some some figures for you. Um, but actually, it, it, in, in terms of the uh, the requirements and responsibilities that, uh, as a corporate body, as a parliament, we take on uh, to reduce our, our, our carbon footprint, I mean, there, there are a series of benefits that come from this that we think are just uh, are sensible to be making. If you had figures, that would be helpful, because I think both from the public perception yeah. as well, that it seems like a lot of money, but yeah. if, if we're saving yeah. 20000 30000 a year, that, uh, that would look uh, good. Uh, I, I think my final area, was, um, which has already been touched on, was the, uh, the, the whole question of the contingency for the additional powers referred to the Commissioner for Children and Young People. C can you explain to us how that's handled? I mean, who is holding this contingency? Who will decide if it's being released? What happens to it if it's not needed? That, that kind of thing? Well, I mean, the Finance Committee um, had, a, uh, had a very key hand in um, the scrutiny of the Children and Young People's Bill um, in, in relation to the fin financial memorandum. Uh, that was exceptionally useful for um, those of us members of the, the Education and Culture Committee who uh, were leading in relation to the, 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 um, the, the policy scrutiny of the bill. Um, it was a, a, an issue of um, uh, the the need for and the the, uh, the timetable for requiring those additional resources um, to, to meet the additional powers that were being conveyed through the bill was a, a subject of some debate through our consideration um, of the uh, of the bill. There was a bit of toing froing between uh, the committee and the commissioner and the committee and Scottish ministers. We felt we'd got it resolved by the time um, the, the bill got to, to stage three. Um, but I think where, um, where the, the, the bid then came through the, the, the Commissioner for those, uh, those additional resources, it appeared that um, some of what was being said um, didn't quite square with the assurances that we'd been given uh, during the, uh, the, the scrutiny of that bill and, and therefore um, we uh, had the Commissioner back in, in front of us for, for further um, questioning. Um, he provided written evidence as well, which again suggested that um, some staffing reallocation had already taken place, um, that a mapping exercise to ascertain the, the, the level of need uh, and the type of need uh, was to be undertaken all of which made us um, a little uncomfortable that, um, we, that, that as a committee, um, that, 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 that this work hadn't already been done. And as a corporate body responsible for signing off on the budget, I think um, we shared those, those concerns. So I think what we've, we've agreed is that um, that further work is, is absolutely uh, essential. Um, the staffing reallocation has already taken place um, within the Commissioner's office to allow that to happen and therefore for the time being we don't see a need to release that, that, that funding. But nevertheless, Parliament has passed this Act, it's, conveyed th it's conferred those additional powers uh, on the Commissioner uh, and therefore I think it's only sensible for us to, to set aside uh, those additional resources. I think it's uh, £51,000 um, as, as part of the contingency to enable the, the, the Commissioner, should the case be made to, to, to draw those down in a timely fashion. But until we see that further working uh, through of the, of the mapping exercise and see the, the, the further case um, developed by the Commissioner, um, we see no reason to, to, to transfer that, that funding. Okay. Well, that's great. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Michael, to be followed by Jean. Thanks, Kevina. Um, the Scottish Welfare Fund Bill is going through the, the Parliament at the moment and both this committee and the Welfare Reform Committee have identified issues around the, the financial memorandum uh, which identifies the, the additional costs that look to be uh, imposed on the Scottish uh, Public Services Ombudsman when they take over responsibility for the, <coughs> the second tier appeals. Can you give us an idea of the discussions you had with the SPSO about what additional funding would be required and just how confident are you 
that the figures that have been put in the financial memorandum stack up because questions have been raised at both this committee and the Welfare Reform Committee about the, the predictions for the additional cost? I, again, I mean, I, I think that's, that, that's very fair. I mean, we've had initial discussions with the Ombudsman. We've had discussions with, with all of the office holders and, and um, I think I've gone into a, got into a pattern of, of having them on, on a reasonably regular basis to talk through uh, a series of issues. I mean, obviously the Ombudsman is one of those um, uh, office holders uh, which is kind of demand-led. Um, it, it, it can be difficult to predict the, the, the kind of pattern of... Uh, of, of, of need and therefore the budget resource that's uh, required, but inevitably um, this is an area that is going to push up the, the, the demands on, on the office. I think there are, there are other areas as well that may, uh, may have a bearing. Um, I, I think in terms of the financial memorandum, I'm not sure that we've taken a view on that as a, as, as a, as a corporate body, but um, Paul would be able to... Um, really, just to sort of underline what Liam said, I, I think the short term we're not in a position at the moment to, to say whether we think that's robust. There have been uh, really constructive discussions with the Ombudsman. Um, but I think uh, um, really drawing a parallel with the point Liam made about working with this committee and the Education Committee, I think the corporate body and, and officials would be very pleased to work with, uh, with the committee you chair and this committee on that very point um, so that we can come to a common view as to what the, uh, the resources would be. I think Liam's right. I think everyone expects there to be an increase in workload. Um, but we'd be, we're very pleased to work uh, with the Welfare Reform Committee and this committee to get to an agreed position on what those additional resources should be. And I think the corporate body's position is that, you know, until it's satisfied and the committees are satisfied, um, it, it won't um, enter into any firm agreement as to what additional resources should be released. I mean, I think from the Education Committee point of view, uh, as I said previously, it was this committee that um, I think um, sounded the first um, uh, warning around the, the financial memorandum in relation to, to the new powers of the, of the Commission as well as other issues, but, but um, particularly in relation to the, the new powers. And therefore, I think um, any views that you have in relation to, to this particular cost pressure on, on, on the Ombudsman, I, I think, are, are ones that as a corporate body we would very much welcome. Okay, that seems clear enough. Thanks, Convener. Okay, uh, thank you. Jean, to be followed by Gavin. Uh, thanks, Convener, and uh, good morning. <coughs> Could I just uh, tease out maybe a wee bit more about the digital programme and the, and the upgrade of that? Um, you did say that it would be better facilities for members, and I, I just was hoping that it, it would be better access for the public too. I mean, are we, I presume this programme is really about the Parliament beginning to um, open up digitally to other parts, parts that are hard to reach maybe, um, and giving people access, is that right? I, absolutely. I mean, I think that's uh, it, it's recognising that um, the, the expectation on on members in terms of the way that they um, uh, carry out their their responsibilities is changing. Now, now different MSPs uh, are uh, are in different places in relation to that. Um, each of us uh, have our own idiosyncrasies in terms of the way that we that we work. But I mean, all of us, I would I would hope, have a, a personal commitment to being as open and accessible as as possible and collectively as a parliament that has always been a fundamental principle of this parliament so whether or not it's looking at um, greater uh, use of um, teleconferencing facilities having um, witnesses give evidence by by uh, by teleconference where possible and i know that uh, as a former member of the rural affairs committee i know that we took evidence uh, on occasion from meps um, uh, while they were based in, in in brussels or strasbourg by 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 video link Similarly, there'll be um, constituents of mine and, and, and yours who will find it far more um, uh, logistically feasible to, to, to do that than necessarily uh, hike down the, the A9 or, or fly down to, to Edinburgh. So that's just one example. But I, I, I think if you look at the way in which casework is coming to, to MSPs through social media rather than through, um, through snail mail or even email now, 
the, the, those changing demands are, are, are ones that, that all of us recognise. As I say, um, we each work slightly differently. I think the public's expectations of how they, they, they access the Parliament uh, will, will change. If, if I look at uh, an issue that, that uh, is obviously of key interest to, to this committee, um, some of what we've been doing in terms of making um, budget scrutiny more accessible, not just to MSPs but to the public generally, is reflected in a tool that, that, that is now available on the Scottish Parliament website that, that allows you a kind of pictorial um, uh, explanation of, of, of budget lines and unpacking it down to, 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 to level four that allows you to, to put in um, uh, different configurations on the, on the, uh, on the new uh, taxation uh, responsibilities we have to see what the impact would be on, on, on uh, revenue into, uh, into a Scottish exchequer. I think given the, the expectations uh, in relation to more powers uh, for this parliament, particularly taxation powers, that is a sensible investment for us to be making and is one which we'll probably have to uh, develop yet further. So I think in a whole range of areas, it, it's something where uh, we are very conscious that we can't afford to be too far behind the curve, but we also need to recognise that, that different MSPs um, uh, operate in, in, in different ways and we need to make sure that we're supporting uh, all of them um, equally um, throughout the process. Paul. Yeah, uh, I can maybe give you a couple of specific examples just to underline the point Liam made. Um, one of the um, streams within the digital program is the online uh, approach, and we're looking, our website still remains by far the most uh, significant window on the Parliament, if you like, online, and we're looking to um, uh, whether we can improve that. Uh, there's an open data uh, project within it, which I think is absolutely critical to allowing uh, the public to... to um, access information stored by the Parliament. And then just a very uh, recent example, uh, as you, you may have picked up in the media, you know, we're significantly increasing our apprenticeship program, uh, and we used a lot of social media to uh, make that available to a very large, well, basically a large number um, of people. We had a hugely successful event here in the Parliament last Friday, but in fact it was promoted largely through web and social media. So that's some maybe specific examples of how we think it can benefit the public as well as members. Thank you. <coughs> I mean, I, I was, I, I guess, particularly thinking of people who might like to give evidence um, to a committee but uh, live in Shetland or the Western Isles or, you know, some of the furthest flung parts of... And that, that, that really kind of merits, I think, work, work working with other organisations that are equally... Uh, digitally advanced and I mean I presume that, that that's happening whether it's through you know the health service who are developing a lot of digital doing digital work themselves or uh, the University of the Highlands and Islands who has a, an, an extraordinary network now and and uh, local councils that, that these kind of partnerships can be made to I, I, mean, have I, access. I think that's a very fair point Jean um, I, I mean I there's no point in us developing a digital presence that then doesn't speak to what's happening in in, uh, in other um, parts of the kind of public and, and third sector and, and the private sector for that matter. I mean, I I, I can recall instances where it, uh, setting up a um, a video conference. Um, uh, was frustrated by the fact that the operating system uh, within the Parliament was different from the operating system in in, in, in one of the local um, I think schools in uh, in Orkney. And now, if we've got different operating systems, then we can we can um, claim all we like that we're being more accessible because we are making this investment in in digital technology. But but if it's not speaking to to, to the technology that's used by some of those who would make uh, potentially make best use of it. Uh, then, in a sense, it, 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 it doesn't seem to have gone any way towards uh, achieving the objective. So I, I think continually talking to um, those, uh, those partners in the public third sector and, and indeed private sector is, is, going to be, is going to be crucially important. Thank you. And um, just a, a wee question on the shop. Um, being the only female member of the Finance Committee, I hate to ask about the shop, but... <coughs> I wonder, I mean, it's, it's interesting that the, it, it's really good to see it turned around and making a contribution. Um, would I be right in, in thinking that the, the, the 260 turnover is possibly reflected in the, in the Great Tapestry of Scotland exhibition and that the, the book sales and, I mean, having the highest number of 
attendees, I think, at that exhibition. Am I right in saying that? That that would have reflected in the in the shop sales. Can, can I just? At, at the outset, thank you for asking the question about the shop, because the shop kept coming up when it was uh, making a loss. The fact, the fact that it's now making a profit, um, I, I think, needs to be acknowledged. Now, there's no doubt that um, some of that is to do with the, the footfall generated by the Take the Great Tapestry exhibition um, uh, over the last couple of years, the, the, the Warhol exhibition as well, I think, had a, uh, a positive impact in terms of the numbers uh, that were coming through, uh, through the building. I think the location, um, some of the decisions that were taken about um, staffing um, and also the product lines uh, as well, I mean, all of those ha have had um, a bearing on, uh, on, on turning this, uh, this around. But as you'll see, I mean, the projections going forward are, are, are to continue, I mean, it's never going to be a cash cow, uh, but continue to show a, 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 modest, uh, a modest profit. And, and uh, I, I think that illustrates um, our confidence that, um, that because of what we've done in terms of the, the relocation, the, the product lines, but also our commitment to, um, uh, to, to, to looking at further um, uh, initiatives. With, I mean, the Great Tapestry has been a, a, a rip-roaring success. I mean, this year I think we were able to, to plan for that success um, rather better than the previous year where it maybe caught us a little bit uh, by surprise. But I think the commitment is to look at other ways in which we um, can encourage people um, to come into the Parliament that perhaps otherwise we wouldn't have done so. And I think that was the other thing about the Great Tapestry and the, the Warhol exhibition. We were seeing people that were coming to the Parliament for the first time. And I think we, we always need to be conscious of the need to, to try and do that. I'm really pleased to hear that. Um, the other thing, and it's just a suggestion really, is that it seems that we do get a, a large number of visitors to Scotland to the Parliament, and um, I, it occurs to me that there might be an opportunity, I suggest, um, to reflect some of the uh, wonderful uh, craft products and so on from different, from, you know, all of our different parts of Scotland, but could be reflected even for a, for a period of time, a kind of three months reflecting Orkney or three months reflecting Arran or whatever. And I just wonder whether that's something that you would consider doing. It's certainly something we've we've um, taken on board in the past. I mean, obviously, um, I, 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 I declare an interest. I, I pressed the case quite uh, vociferously on behalf of Sheila Fleet um, not so long ago and, 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 um, and successfully. Um, I, there are other examples uh, of that. Again, I think it's always a balance between uh, trying to have uh, um, sort of um, product lines that that are, are, are going to are going to shift. Um, I think we we've recognised that a lot of a lot of people, I mean, particularly school parties who are through here on such a regular basis, are kind of looking for something that is a, a bit of a souvenir, um, but but is. Of, of, I understand yeah. the stock yeah. that's there and why it might mm. be there. I was just really thinking that it might reflect some of the some of the produce uh, of Scotland. I think, uh, yeah. I mean, I think that's I think that's a, f a, a fair point. I mean, it, it's something that we we, we look to, to to try and do. I mean, I don't know if, if Paul has uh, examples of of, of of particular initiatives in that respect. But uh, yes, I mean, it's it, it is literally a short window, and and therefore, if we can, if we can use that to best effect, even if it's not at a commercial level, it, it, it just it raises awareness of of, uh, of other producers, uh, Scottish producers. Then I, I think we can do that. Just brief. Our, our ambition is is, is just that. Um, Liam said, right, we have to strike a balance at the end of the day, but our ambition is just that. And uh, a number of members uh, contact the shop, and I would just say, you know, they're, they're always. Uh, happy to talk to members if they think there's particular products from their regional constituency that they think would reflect well on, on Scotland and would sell. So, you know, I would encourage any member to, uh, you know, talk to the shop manager. Um, and, uh, you know, we've been, as Liam said, I can think of two or three others where we have followed that through and they have become um, feasible lines. As you say, sometimes for a short run, sometimes they've become, um, you know, uh, ongoing stock. So any member who thinks they have a um, something uh, like that in their constituency or region should just get in touch with the top. I can't promise we'll stop them, but we'll certainly talk to the member and explore that with them. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, <coughs> now, just looking at the, at the shop um, figures here, actually, I mean, uh, Jean shouldn't feel bad because it's one of the things at the end of the committee I was going around off on in terms of the shop, actually. I would say it's difficult not to make money when you're selling single malts at 36 quid a bottle, you know. 
And I mean, you know, the number of those that we had to get signed for auctions and raffles over the last few months to run up to the referendum, I must have punted up your sails. Anyway, Gavin. <laughs> right, yeah, well, no, he, he became particularly animated when the suggestion of uh, product lines from Aaron was suggested. He really uh, perked up at that point. Um, not, not much uh, left to ask, I think. But the first one is, um, in terms of the maintenance budget, um, in the, the schedule that you've given to us, there's a, a small increase this year, I think up to um, just over 2.1 uh, million for 15-16. For you then add the statement, the nature of this work is that there will be peaks and troughs over the years in line with our 25-year maintenance plan. I suppose my question is, being, being realistic, are there, are there actually peaks and troughs in terms of maintenance, or is it something that we'll just see a small increase year on year over the next few years? I think with the 25-year um, plan, uh, there is a bit of flexibility in, in terms of where we, where we, uh, we carry out that, that work and, and we try to respond to what else is going on uh, in, in the building and in the budget uh, at, at the time. Um, I mean, obviously, the ongoing checking and maintenance is a crucial part of identifying um, the issues before they become problems that, that, that have to be reactively um, and, and, and inevitably costly uh, dealt with. Um, uh, I think it's, it, I mean, this is a building that is um, particularly iconic. It's, it's heavily used. Um, the, the, the expectations around the, um, uh, the standard to which it is, is kept are, 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 are pretty high. Um, and that even against the backdrop of a, of a tight budget, we've, we've tried to make sure that that maintenance spend has been, um, has been consistently um, preserved. So I, I think there are, I think there is a bit of a, an ebb and flow to it because there will be, there will be bigger ticket items that will that will um, come along um, uh, that that can be done one year, they can be put off to, to to the next year, but will have to be done sort of within probably a two three year um, window, and, uh, and 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 therefore that will that will result in the in the budget being higher that year than the than the previous year or the, or the subsequent year. Um, but it, as I say, it's part of a, a, 20 year, a 25 year plan um, that is aimed at trying to make sure that uh, we don't get horrific spikes um, or that we, we uh, rein back on, on the ongoing uh, maintenance of the, of the fabric of the building, uh, for which I don't think, again, we'd be, we'd be thanked ultimately. I don't know, Derek, is there anything particularly you'd want to... No, I think, I, that, I mean, it, it is an area where we have seen bigger movements year on year in previous years. It's, it's quite a small differential this year, um, but FM does try to smooth the pattern as much as it can. Thank you. And the only other question was just, just coming back, Liam, to one of your earlier answers about um, commissioners and ombudsmen, and I think the, the, the property costs of those, obviously, I think it was a convener who pointed out last year that I think you, you were hopeful that there might be scope to um, save costs on, on offices by, by merging offices as such. From your answer today, it suggests that, that that's just probably unlikely. I mean, if, if one is going to be, when one's based in St Andrews, if one has recently moved offices and presumably signed a, a sort of uh, at least a medium-term lease, I would imagine, looking forward, I, I suspect, is that just unlikely that the, we're going to make costs by, by moving offices together? Yeah, I mean, I think we've got a bit of co-location uh, at the current time. There's there's additional capacity in the um, in the Rosebery House uh, facility that um, the Children's Commission has moved into, and and, and we've made it uh, abundantly clear that um, we see this as an opportunity for um, utilising that space for uh, f for others, um, which will um, I, I would assume release uh, some saving. But uh, in terms of uh, additional um, co-locations, I think we've we're kind of at the point at the moment where we don't see an immediate way of of of, um, of, of triggering um, other opportunities. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Malcolm. You say that um, since the baseline year of 2010-11, the staff pay budget has reduced by 9.2% in real terms. Is that, um, to what extent is that a reduction in the number of staff or has <coughs> real terms pay been going down to an extent as well? 
Well, I mean, I think we've seen a reduction in staffing of, I think, 64 full-time um, equivalents, about 12% uh, of the overall um, uh, the overall staffing. I mean, obviously, we've been able to, to do quite a bit in um, changing uh, patterns of work uh, and the like, which, again, has enabled us to, to release uh, some savings or work more uh, efficiently through the clerking team, through SPICE, through security. Um, but in terms of uh, actual pay, real terms pay, Paul, do you...? Yeah, yes, it's been a combination of both. As, as, as Liam said, the, the permanent um, headcount um, is down uh, by around about 60 posts, but there has been pay restraints as well, um, broadly following Scottish public sector pay, which has been uh, a real term uh, reduction. Um, and so it's been a combination of the two which has delivered that saving. So obviously I'm concerned about um, staff pay, not least the staff in the room, but uh, I suppose I'm particularly concerned about uh, those on low pay. I mean, would, would, does everybody in the parliament receive what's now called the living wage? We are hopeful, um, in fact, I'm going straight from this committee meeting to a meeting of the corporate body where hopefully we will be able to um, discuss and sign off on, on a paper that will allow us to make an announcement um, in the not too distant future in relation to um, uh, Parliament, uh, our corporate body uh, staff. Um, obviously, the staffing arrangements for, for individual MP, MSPs are, are, are a matter for, for them, but, but um, I think given the, the, the publicity surrounding this issue, uh, I think um, all of the parties have made it fairly clear uh, where, they, where they stand on that. Um, but it's, it's obviously not something that the, the corporate body can directly uh, intervene in, but certainly in relation to, to corporate body um, uh, uh, corporate body staff, um, we, uh, uh, we are confident that uh, all are, are, are paid uh, above the living wage. And in terms of those that we contract in, while we haven't been able to, to put this um, as a provision within the contract, with the contracts that we've, uh, we've signed, uh, discussions have then, negotiations have then taken place about ensuring that uh, all of those um, that are employed within the, the, the Parliament um, are paid above the, the living wage. Now, there are issues around pay differentials and the knock-on implications for, for, for those contractor staff in, in other locations, but um, the discussions um, that we've had so far have been pretty constructive mm -hmm. and, and therefore we, we believe we've, we've made progress. Um, but I think before, um, uh, before making any public declaration, as I say, it's an issue that we're discussing in the corporate body later on this morning and hopefully we'll be able to say something in, in pretty short, short order. Yeah. And are there any zero-hour contracts in the Parliament? <laughs> there are, in, in relation to, for example, the events team, where what you have is, 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 is fairly specific short-term um, uh, arrangements <coughs> around particular events, um, there may be um, there may be some zero hours contracts which, uh, frankly, seem to suit the, the interests of, of 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 both parties, just given the nature of the type of work. Um, but I'm I'm confident that uh, across the piece, there's not an inappropriate use of zero hours contracts in terms of uh, staffing within the parliament. So I was pleased to hear just one other topic uh, about the I suppose the spend to save on lighting in the chamber. Um, is, there, is, there, is that possible at all for the committee rooms? I'm always worried about the amount of light that seems to be shining on us when we're in committee rooms. That's, that's the purpose of committee meetings, is it not? <laughs> um, I, I, I think we've, we've looked to do it um, uh, progressively, um, starting with the, with the obvious and the easiest places to do it. Uh, I mean, the chamber is, a, is for a whole um, series of reasons, a, a more complex proposition, but, but we le believe we're now in a position to be able to, uh, to, to do that um, and, and release the, the, the environmental and the, 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 the financial savings that will result from it. In terms of the committee rooms, I don't know, Paul, if you've got... Yeah, I, um, if obviously as part of the project, we're looking at the sort of the technological solutions. If we can find a solution for the chamber, then as you'll know, we use very similar technologies in the committee rooms. So I think if the chamber is successful, um, I would certainly be uh, expecting the FM team to look at how we might roll that out to committees uh, over, the, over the course. But I think we'll get the chamber established first to say if that's successful, then we, and we know we can deploy that technology. As Liam said, the, these rooms um, would be easier um, than the chamber. So if the chamber is successful, I would expect us to come forward with proposals over coming years to uh, resolve the committee rooms as well. Okay, thanks.
as the deputy conveners just whispered to me, it would not be easy to start with a committee room and then if it's successful, we move on to the chamber rather than the other way around. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the reason we're doing it in the uh, chamber first is it's by far the biggest uh, consumer of electricity and it's far more expensive. You don't actually need to erect the big scaffolds in here, so I think the potential benefits of doing the chamber uh, are very much more substantial. So I think that's the reason we're doing it that way around. Okay, thank you. But a very good question. And one, <laughs> I'm w one I was beginning to ask myself as Paul was speaking. <laughs> it's okay. It was John's. It wasn't mine. I just wanted to go He was a bit getting too shy, really, to say it himself. Well, that's concluded questions from the committee. I'll just get just really one or two just to finish off with, just to round things off. And uh, it, um, Malcolm obviously asked the, about the issue of, um, you know, staff, uh, staff, um, salaries etc and uh, on the page two of your report and in, in the section approach to setting the budget you talk about ongoing pay restraint below level inflation for members and staff We've touched on this already and you, you but, but i was intrigued by the fact that you say there's a 9.2 percent reduction in real terms but there's been a 12 percent reduction in staff numbers well that that tells me therefore that the that per staff member there's been a real terms increase of about three percent now clearly a lot of members haven't had any um, uh, pay rise above inflation. Um, so how is this um, disparity? How do you explain it? Is it because people have been promoted within the, the ranks? I mean, what's yeah. what's the position? I mean, there'll here? definitely be a, 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 a progression. Um, and I think in terms of the, redeploy the redeployment as, as well in different roles, I mean, roles will be will not necessarily equate in the same way um, uh, across that, that period. So I suspect that, that that will have had some bearing. But Yes, I mean, it's, it, there are two particular uh, factors. One is incremental uh, rise, and I, I believe myself very, very strongly that incremental rise is a part of the contracts we have with staff. So, you know, I think we should honour those, and we have done. So they, that, that continues, the, whereas the, the annual pay rise is the inflation-related one. Um, and the other is that, um, you know, within the whole staff pay budget, there's also uh, temporary staff or additional. So, for example, the apprentices I talked about earlier, they're supernumerary. Um, given that the idea is that having completed their apprenticeship, they'll be able to compete for permanent jobs. So there are other factors in there um, uh, which I think explain the discrepancy that you picked up. In terms of the incremental rises, that means there's quite a lot of staff who now are no longer getting incremental rises because they're at the top of their scale? That, that is the case, actually. Uh, we're a you know, relatively low turnover organisation, so a significant number of staff are at the top of it, and they would only get the you know, the, whatever the inflation pay rise was each year, that, that's absolutely right. Okay. Um, and in and, and 2016, 17 figures, I don't really want to go into them, but there seems to be a significant uh, increase in terms of, of pay relative to this year, you know, 3% or so. Are you hoping that perhaps uh, the, the, the settlement, I know you're still negotiating with the unions, but you hope that the settlement will be a bit more generous in, in that year in terms of staff who perhaps are at the... Are, um, at the top of their scale and haven't received any significant pay rise for a number of years. We've seen evidence of Paul's negotiation on on um, on the rates issue. So I mean, clearly, it, nothing is a foregone conclusion. But I, mean, I think we're anticipating a modest yeah, increase. I, I, I'm very reluctant to come before the committee and not give a helpful answer. But uh, we. We are just about to begin negotiations, and uh, if you don't mind, I think I'd prefer just to say. I'm just hoping there's some light at the end that. of the tunnel for the staff. That's the, 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 all. The, the, there's there's always light at the end of the tunnel, for convener. But, uh, as long as no train coming in the other direction. And just one final question. It's just a small one. Uh, I've been looking at the figures for the, you know, the Standards Commission, which have seemed to have oscillated a wee bit over recent years. The Standards Commission, and they're going up by about five percent. I'm just wondering if you can tell us why they're just they're going up by five point one percent over the next year. Yeah, I, I mean, I think as I said earlier, um, some of the uh, the office holders um, are in a bit of a, a kind of demand-led situation, and uh, I think one of the issues that we've been keen to discuss with them when they've come in to speak to us is um, what proportion of the work are they doing to try and manage that demand down by uh, raising awareness um, amongst uh, uh, local councillors and, uh, and public bodies about the responsibilities um, in this area. Um, and uh, but I think we're still seeing it at certain points in the in the political and electoral cycle that you'll get spikes in the in the number of complaints that are uh, that are raised. Um, I think the uh, I think in relation to standards, there is a, a, an attempt to try and triage that more effectively 
so that you're, you're not seeing complaints um, run unduly long and dealt with in a more sort of efficient and effective way, as well as the, the kind of proactive work that's being done to try and raise understanding about uh, what, the, what the what the code says and, and the behaviour that is uh, expected of, of uh, public authorities. So um, I, I think some of this we think um, we're seeing evidence of, of, of being managed down to an extent, but I, I think we're still conscious that um, for, for reasons to do with um, probably politics and elections, there's still going to be um, uh, periods where um, you almost get tit for tat um, complaints being being raised, and and even if you triage them, you're still having to you're still having to deal with them. There's still a 16% reduction overall from baseline yeah. in terms yeah. of the standards commission, 17% for all the office holders. I was just wondering why there was that wee increase, which seems anomalous to to others, but that was a, a fairly uh, good explanation. Anyway, I think that appears to have concluded all the questions today. I'd like to thank, um, you know, um, um, Derek, Liam and uh, Paul for coming for us today. Is there anything else you would like to point out to committee? Any further points you wish to raise? I think one one thing, uh, beyond thanking you for, for your uh, uh, scrutiny and continued support and a lot of the work that, that we're doing, um, one area where perhaps we, we didn't cover um, uh, this morning is in relation to um, potential additional powers and, and some of the pressures that that's likely to, to put on the, the Parliament as a, as a whole and on our resources. And I'm conscious. Yeah. Individual yeah. kind of um, statement, so I didn't really want to yeah. go into that because I, I think quite clearly until we know what they are, it's it, kind of difficult exactly. to ask about it. Exactly. Um, but I, I think I would, I would um, clearly we, we, we may return to this um, same time next year. But I think if in the interim, once the picture becomes a little clearer, um, I, given that the finance committee is is likely to be to be one that is is going to see an additional kind of pressure uh, on your on your own capacity and and, and resources. Um, I think as a corporate body, um, we would value, and certainly personally, I would, I would value your input as to how we manage that, because there's, there's, there's no doubt that um, those, uh, those additional pressures will, will present additional challenges to, to us in terms of, of managing that budget. So perhaps there'll be an opportunity um, at, at some point, middle part of next year, to, to, to sit down with the committee and, and discuss those. Certainly appreciate that. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you, Liam. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm now going to call a five-minute recess to, in order to have a, a change of witness and allow members an actual break. <laughs>
Uh, I'll give apologies on behalf of um, Michael McMahon, uh, as convener of the Welfare Reform Committee. He has to meet a, a, a group um, downstairs who are coming to committee next week who have uh, mental health issues. He wants to show them the room, etc. So he'll, he'll perhaps join us in 15, uh, 20 minutes or so. So we'll continue uh, without him. Okay, so um, our next item of business. Uh, to open the session formally, to take evidence on the devolved taxes implementation from uh, Eleanor Emerson, Head of Revenue Scotland, the Scottish Government, uh, John King, Director of Registration, Registers of Scotland, and John Kenny, Head of National Operations, Scottish Environmental Protection Agency. And members have received copies of the most recent progress updates uh, from our witnesses, so we will actually go straight to two questions. And, I mean, veterans of the committee, so you'll know the, know the drill, so to speak. Um, so I shall uh, start off first. Um, and first question is really to your, yourself, Eleanor, basically. Um, you talk about the most, in your paper, the most recent estimate for total cost and set up for the first five years being 21.2 million, uh, a figure which excludes the estimated cost of £730,000 for Scottish Tax Tribunal, which was actually included in the RSTP uh, Bill's financial memorandum and Revenue Scotland's uh, previous progress report, but it's now been excluded as being quite separate. So I'm wondering if you can explain to us why it's now quite separate when it wasn't before, uh, and also explain why there's been a quite significant increase of about 9% um, in terms of the cost for establishing and running the devolved taxes. Um, Ella. Okay. Uh, good morning, convener. Um, the, the, the costs uh, of the tax tribunal were, I think, properly included in the financial memorandum of the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill because they were costs that, that are relevant to that legislation. Um, the reason I've excluded them this time round is um, it, it's the comparison back to that HMRC estimate of 22.3 million. Um, the 22.3 million that HMRC quoted would never have covered costs of tax tribunal, whatever had been done about a tax tribunal. Um, perhaps with hindsight, we could have made that clearer at the time of the of the financial memorandum. Um, but it, they're not they're not costs that HMRC would have borne. They're not costs that Revenue Scotland bear. They're they're, they're costs overall associated with running the taxes. So they were properly in the financial memorandum of the bill, but they're not part of the cost that we like to add up and compare to the original tw HMRC 22.3 million estimate. Um, as far as the, the increase in cost go, um, as I, can, I can obviously answer more questions about the detail, but as I, as I broadly explained in my update, this is additional staff cost. It's almost exclusively staff cost um, associated with the implementation. There, there are three broad groups. Um, there are program and project management staff which we've bolstered um, as a response to gateway review recommendations and, and indeed in our own um, need to manage the programme and project very, very tightly through this last nine months, ten months of implementation work. Uh, we've also got additional staff uh, on, we, on um, business analysts working between the process design and our IT contractor so we know that there have been in the past problems with government IT projects. Things can sometimes overrun or not deliver as required. We put in additional business analysts to make sure that as we go through every iteration of the IT system, we're completely on top of managing that very tightly and that it's going to deliver what it needs to deliver and stay within its budget. And uh, the third group is additional staff I've put in to make quite sure that we will deliver all that is required in time of all the different aspects of setup in time for uh, April. So it's, it's setup costs associated with staff. You, know, you did say, uh, as you mentioned earlier, that increased investment staff costs for implementation are now falling in 2015 16. And you talked about uh, most of the additional costs being staff, but we didn't really get a breakdown of that uh, in terms of the report uh, that was given. And you talked about managing things very tightly, but there seems to be quite a divergence in the number of staff, um, you know, anticipated uh, future staff, 41 in the first live year of operation compared with an estimate of 30 in the bill's FM. So there seems to be quite a wide divergence in terms of the number of staff uh, that's been required. Um, 
And I know you've said that this is uh, to provide additional capacity in the critical early months. But again, we've not received any detailed estimates um, uh, provided for that. Um, I, I mean, if it would be helpful to the committee, I can send you a staffing structure now and show you who the 41 are and what they'll be doing. Yeah. Um, very happy to send that in if you would find that useful. Mm -hmm. uh, the, in the financial memorandum of the bill, yes, we, we were talking a number of the order of 30. We also had the additional investment in compliance. Um, so there are three staff that come from that as well. So we're talking about probably eight posts here. Uh, different between what we said in the financial mem memorandum and what we're seeing now. Um, uh, and this is our best estimate of what it needs to make sure that we can do this safely, reliably, make sure we can deliver the service and get the money in the door. Okay. And how likely is it that these figures are going to change again in the, the months ahead, do you think? Um, I, I don't expect us to uh, be recruiting beyond the 41 we, we're on we have a plan of how we're going to staff up for the 41 um we have uh, 12 of those people identified already we have another uh, eight that are being nine sorry that are being interviewed for within the next two weeks and then the further tranche coming on behind that um that's what we are going to go live with um obviously once we go live and we see how we're doing um i can't speak for what might you know, what, what changes that might be made in future years, particularly once we have a board and, and once we have some experience of live running, but that's the structure we're working to and that's for the foreseeable future. And how flexible will your structure be? Uh, should additional powers be um, devolved to Scotland? Um, we obviously recognise that we may need to respond to that. Um, it would depend entirely on what the additional powers were. Um, I mean, if, if there were further small taxes, transactional based taxes will have a good platform to build on, but I would expect that any significant extra power would involve some more staff and some more implementation work because that's just the nature of the of what we have to do. Okay. And just uh, in terms of the RSTB Bill FM uh, which stated that the intention is for Revenue Scotland to delegate operational responsibility for the collection of SLFT to SEPA, but the latest progress report said it was agreed SEPA will not collect tax data or process any uh, SLFT transactions on behalf of Revenue Scotland. Um, so I'm just wondering why there's been that change with regard to the Scottish landfill tax. I don't know if you wish to respond or uh, or Mr. Mr. Kenny. Well, say something first and then sure. invite John to come in. So uh, I think when we last uh, were in front of the committee, we, we would have explained about the IT system change. Um, I have to go a long way back in the development here. When you saw the financial memorandum for the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill, that included a, a new additional investment in an IT system for Revenue Scotland, and that was based on work that had been done, the detailed business analysis, the detailed requirements around um, IT work that we had done uh, which really highlighted that a more efficient way and a more robust way of delivering the online system for um, collection of landfill tax and collection of land and buildings transaction tax was going to be development of a system at Revenue Scotland and integrated appropriately with um, systems at SEPA and, with, uh, and, and at registers rather than simply a system at SEPA and a system at registers and nothing sitting in the middle. Um, as we've worked through all of that, um, it, it means that the, the, the actual upfront collection role for SEPA isn't, isn't particularly significant um, because people will make their, their returns and Revenue Scotland will process that and we will handle all of the payments and we will store the taxpayer data. Um, however, SEPA's role is very significant around um, two areas, um, partic the biggest one being compliance and making sure that, um, that uh, taxpayers are accurately paying the correct amount of tax and indeed, as you know, uh, tackling the illegal dumping problem and, and trying to recover tax from people who have been illegally dumping. Um, the other role that SEPA will have in all of this is information because SEPA will have um, staff going out onto landfill sites, they're bound to be asked questions about tax, amongst other things, so they will be able to help us 
um, spread the word and they're already helping us work with landfill operators to make sure that this all goes as smoothly as it as it can i don't know if john would like to add something to that <coughs> yeah thanks eleanor yeah it was really around the it system change and the recognition that it was a more efficient way of delivering a system across the taxes that, that within that and also a, more, a, a, a better way of holding holding the sensitive data for for revenue scotland to be the holders of that data and it's in its entirety so that was the that's the reason for the that's the reason for the change. Okay, it's just that uh, you know um, neither the revised uh, set and running costs have been agreed with uh, um, have been included in the the figures to the committee. You know they've been agreed with Revenue Scotland, but we haven't been received any figures for that. Okay, I, I can tell you what the revised costs are for the, the running the running mm -hmm. costs. Uh, the set up costs are reduced by reduced by two hundred and fifty thousand on the on the back of the IT change. Right. And uh, so, um, and what about running? If that's the setup cost, what the running costs? The running costs have have, have, have come down a little. The, the main the main cost in it was setting up the IS system. So the running costs have come, I think, have come down a little from about six hundred and ten thousand to just under just under six hundred thousand. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I mean, Mr. King, um, you know, Registers of Scotland is self financing from the the. Income it receives for the services provided. Um, the, I mean, the cost it incurs in relation to LBT to be met by the government. Um, the RSTB bill estimates set up costs of three hundred thirty-five thousand, and running costs for the last five years of one point six two five million pounds. Uh, but I'm just wondering if there's been any changes to the these estimates, or if these estimates remain um, as as before. Um. We, we've certainly been reviewing our estimates. We do that every month. In terms of the, um, the set-up costs, um, we still envisage they'll be in the region of 335,000, certainly no more than that. Um, there has been some reallocation of the, the individual components within that 335,000 figure. Um, an example of that would have been the, the IT costs. They've came down from um, 85 to 70,000. Um, our spend to date is in the region of 176,000, and we anticipate that our spend um, by the time we get to the end of March, by the time we get to go live, will be in the region of 300 to 335 maximum. Um, we'll be in a position within the next four to six weeks to have um, a very high degree of certainty as to what that end spend will be. Um, it's dependent on just the refining. Um, exactly what it is we are, particularly on the IT side, what we'll be delivering along with um, Revenue Scotland's IT provider. Okay. Okay. Um, Eleanor, back to you, and just just to ask a wee bit about the tax gap for LBTT. Uh, you see in your report that this could be around 4.5 million a year, and you go on to talk about an additional investment in tax compliance of 230,000 pounds aimed at reducing the expected tax gap. Uh, so, two questions here. One, what is the gap currently in terms of L S A D L T, and what do you expect to reduce the tax gap by for this uh, investment of two hundred thirty thousand? Um, I'm I do apologise. I don't have the figures for the S D L T tax gap in front of me here. Um, we did look into that when we did the financial memorandum for the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill, um, but I I don't have the figure in my head. I know that we took the SDLT estimate and we reduced it somewhat as an estimate for LBTT because we recognise that the legislation which the Parliament has passed for LBTT uh, has already attempted to close some loopholes and some routes for avoidance. So we had already taken the SDLT figure and, and scaled back somewhat. Um, what we, we haven't attempted to estimate how much we can close the gap by... What we have said is that there's 200 and the £230,000 estimate for additional investment in compliance. Um, the refined figure, my, my latest estimate for that is actually 259000 which is um, 165000 for three staff at Revenue Scotland and um, 94000 for for uh, staff at SEPA. So it's across the two taxes. Um, the, the three staff at Revenue Scotland will be focused mostly on land and buildings transaction tax. And our aim is that those staff will um, pay for themselves several times over and we will be monitoring 
uh, over time how much we're bringing in through the additional compliance activity. Uh, and that will allow the committee um, to understand something about how successful we're being. We, we simply don't have a, the detailed information about the tax gap. We don't have any track record with this brand new tax, really, on which we could make a robust estimate of how much we expect to close the tax gap. So we've, we've gone down the road of saying we understand what, we will, what it will be costing us and we will monitor closely what comes in and we will report that to the committee as we go along. I understand that the stamp duty one tax uh, sorry, um, is uh, £9 million pounds at present. Sorry, night. Stamp duty, to, um, the gap is nine million. So the, in, within Scotland, it's four and a half. Yeah, in Scotland, yeah. so if it's four and a half million here, the the introduction okay. of LBTT itself is, um, is estimated to reduce it by some fifty percent. So but, but I have to say that was a that's an estimate. I mean, of course, we, really, really, that. we don't know. And I and I would I, mm -hmm. my my concern would be not to mislead the committee by trying to give you some figures about what we think we'll be able to bring in that that might look very accurate and very confident, but actually, until we're really doing this, we don't know how successful we'll be. I mean, I think that's something the committee will obviously look at as, as we, we go forward. Um, I've got one or two more questions, but I think I might leave them to the end to see whether or not they're covered by colleagues around the table. Uh, we'll open up um, with uh, Gavin to be followed by John. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, obviously, as with, with many uh, reports given, could have given to committee and then uh, witnesses peering appearing before us, there's a, a slight time gap. Um, obviously, your reports are all from October. Given the sort of tight time scale we've now got, has, has anything materially changed for, for any of your organisations since you submitted um, your written reports in October? Uh, well, there's been a lot of progress, but there's nothing, um, I mean, there's nothing sort of negative that I need to report. Um, we're still on track on all, on all the areas, and there's quite a number of things have happened since early October. We now have draft technical guidance out for consultation. Our website is live. Um, we've seen further releases of IT, further demonstrations of IT. So, you know, a lot, a lot of progress has been made since then. Um, John, no, I don't know. I'll just certainly echo that. I mean, I know it's a question that um, the committee have asked previously around roles and responsibilities between um, certainly ROS and Revenue Scotland. From an ROS perspective, we're now very clear what those roles, what our role is, um, and that's helping us to very much refine the detail of what our operational um, activity will be post 1st of April. Okay. Um, in, in previous reports and previous appearances before the committee, you've, you've submitted alongside a sort of written report, I guess on what might be called a kind of dashboard with, um, I think you use a system of kind of green, amber and red which I think is a project management tool and, and lots of things were green and there, there's the occasional amber. I, I don't think uh, you had many reds, but if, if you use that analogy of kind of uh, uh, green, amber, red, again, in any of your organisations, is there any specific part of the project? Is there anything that would have either an amber or a red light at this stage that, that you think ought to be flagged up? Is there anything that, that could hold progress back for any of your organisations between now and um, the start of April? Um, but the answer has to be yes. I mean, the, of course there are things that could happen that could hold us back between now and April. Um, the, we are using the green, amber, red system. We're, we've been working to um, readiness criteria, so um, a, a series of descriptions of where we need to be and uh, green, amber, red against every single one of those. We, we report that weekly. On a weekly basis, um, we have had small numbers of amber indicators out of two dozen or so criteria. Um, we've been working hard to turn some of the ambers back to green. Um, the, uh, we are doing a, a, an assessment, in fact, this week, um, as I end November, to check where we are on readiness. We will be doing another full assessment at the end of January. Um, I would say we're still on track. Amber to us indicates something isn't exactly on the plan that we had, but we, we have a way of bringing it back. If we didn't think we had a way of bringing it back, it would be red. And that's obviously at that point, warning lights go off and we, we intervene. We have nothing currently at red. Okay, so again, for, across all three organisations, of course, things could go wrong and, and things could happen, but, but for each of your organisations, there is nothing that would be in the, the red category, so to speak, that, that you know, is likely to hold things back. 
So in terms of Registers of Scotland, um, we're very clear about what it is we have to deliver. Um, all aspects of that delivery are standing at green. In terms of the IT components we have to deliver, the main one has already been delivered, so it's already in place. Um, the remaining IT is more behind the scenes. Um, again, we, we, you know, we're aware of what has to be delivered there. That's in, on track. Um, from an ROS perspective, we're, we're very confident that we have everything in place that will support an effective delivery. <coughs> With CPA, similarly to, to Eleanor's answer, ac across the board, we have a number of individual parts of the projects that are at Amber. But again, as Eleanor says, Amber means we're, we're still expecting we're expecting to deliver them. There's just challenges. There's, there's challenges within that, but the, the majority of them are green. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, without being as, as deeply involved in the project uh, as, as obviously any of you are, the one that just as an outsider strikes me as, as potentially the riskiest, as with many projects, is the IT systems. I mean, I think the, if the IT systems function, then we can probably get over most hurdles. If, if they don't, uh, then I, you know, I think there's, there's an immediate issue. In, in terms of, so Mr. King, I mean, I think you said the IT system is, is complete, um, or, or maybe I'm taking, I got the impression it was, it was nearly there. Can you just maybe, I guess, again, each of you, can you give us absolute assurances that, that the IT system is um, being tested uh, robustly and, and there is some kind of contingency just in case uh, something goes wrong on day one, which it would obviously not get us off to, to a great start? Maybe I should just clarify, sure, um, sure. in terms of the IT system, it was the, um, what I was ref ref referring to, and I should have been clear about this, was um, one component which um, ROS had agreed to deliver because we were building it for um, uh, our own internal IT systems, and that's uh, an authentication server, um, which is a way of um, validating users to a system. Um, so we're sharing that with Revenue Scotland. That system's already been delivered, tested, and it's available for Revenue Scotland's IT team to use. Um, in terms of the more general IT, it's probably more appropriate for Eleanor to comment on that. Um, so first of all, yes, I can give you an absolute assurance that everything is being thoroughly tested. Uh, we have, there are various components to this full system, uh, and I'm not the technical expert, so I will just describe them in kind of plain language. There's, there's proper, proper technical descriptions, but there's a, what you might call an electronic form which captures all of the of the data, um, which is not a static thing. It, it, it responds if you tick certain boxes, then it doesn't ask you certain other questions in that sort of way. Yeah? There's a case management system, which is what then Revenue Scotland uses around any individual tax case, so stages where there's a return or a payment, but potentially if there were a dispute or some inquiry or whatever, so there'll be a whole case management system. Um, there's a set of linkages that go on and, and there's something that looks out to the public, which, well, it looks out to solicitors for land and buildings transaction tax and landfill operators for landfill tax, where someone would actually then, who wasn't within Revenue Scotland or Rosa SEPA, would then interact with our system. So to we're intending to deliver all of this in time for April. In fact, we're intending to deliver all of this for the end of January. Um, tested and what I and, and our intention is in February and March to be doing what I would as a lay person describe as snagging just just making absolutely sure that there aren't any you know little glitches um, the the electronic form part is is starting its testing um, imminently and the case management system and so on behind all through December the the outward facing part will be being tested in January. Um, most of the work for all of this is already done. We're now stitching everything together. Um, another thing that has to happen at the end is full security testing and full security accreditation to make absolutely sure that taxpayer data will be secure. Nobody could do anything bad with any of our systems. Um, as I say, we're on track to deliver all of that, but you're absolutely right. We, of course, need a contingency plan in case any element of that fails when we get to the testing stage or we don't get the security accreditation. Um, we will base our contingency, we have our contingency plan based on paper returns because we're going to continue to offer paper returns as an option. Um, solicitors were not all keen to move fully online. We might want in time to move fully online, but 
I think it would have been too big an ask to say we're going to compel you to use an IT system you've never seen and which I can't prove works and which I can't prove is going to be is going to be robust and, and good. So um, we've agreed that we will offer a paper return initially. And that also means that for our contingency plan, if we had to, we would do fully paper returns. We prioritise the order in which we built the IT system to make sure that if we did have to do the paper returns, we'll have all the behind the scenes part of the system to process the paper returns onto. So we are, I think, as robust as we can be. We've mapped out staffing requirement for doing the paper return and so on. Okay, that's, that's helpful, thank you. Um, just a couple of others then. The, the, the convener asked about staff numbers and, and he talked about, I think it was 30 in the initial bill. 41, I think, is, is the current complement. Can I just check, because certainly in the, in the written report, I think the reason was, one of the reasons given was that you wanted to make sure that you had um, uh, an extra complement potentially for year one to make sure that it was a success. Um, ba based on current plans, though, is, is that 41, is, is that simply for year one and you would see it re potentially reducing over time, I suppose, depending on what other responsibilities come your way, or is, or is the 41 likely to be more medium term as it were? It's probably more medium term. Okay. We, on on the, the run of estimates I have in front of me, we would come down by probably only a couple of posts or so in in 16-17, uh, and then we would do what we needed to do from then on based on, we would have proper experience by then of, of how well it was all working in operation. Um, but but the, the figures that I've used in order to develop the estimate, I've only assumed that we drop by a couple of posts in 16, 17 and beyond. And final question, it might be one more for ministers, but you may be able to, to answer it anyway. In terms of subordinate legislation for the, the two devolved taxes, taxes, I mean, as far as Revenue Scotland are concerned, um, are we on track for all the subordinate legislation? Uh, my understanding is that subordinate legislation will all appear in December, and if that happens, then that's fine from a Revenue Scotland point of view. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Deputy Convener. Uh, thanks, uh, Convener. Um, I'm still a little bit confused about the total costs, so maybe we could, you could just clarify, maybe it's my uh, failings, but in the spring, what was it, March 14 report, uh, there was again ref reference to the 16.7 million which had been quoted from Revenue Scotland as compared to HMRC 22.3 million, and the fact that was a 25% uh, less and the statement at that time was made, our estimated costs for the basic collection of the taxes have not changed. They remain at 16.7 million. Uh, in the current report, uh, we have a uh, 21.2 million. In page three, this total cost continues to compare favorably with the original estimate of 22.3 million. So I suppose what I'm wondering is that 21.2 million uh, is obviously an increase over 16.7. If we'd gone with the 22.3 from HMRC, would we also have had that same increase, i.e., I haven't worked it out, four odd, about 4 million, um, extra on top of that? Is all of that extra costs, or is any of that just an increase in the 16.7 base? Um, the, the, uh, the, the 1.7 million that I highlighted to the committee is, is effectively an overspend against the estimates that, that you saw um, back, back at the March report. Um, of that, if, if we were trying to apportion it, about 1.4, 1.5, 1 1.46 million um, would, would be an overspend against the 16.7 and the rest would be a slight overspend against the addition, so-called additional costs. Um, it's very, very difficult to know what HMRC's estimate would be if you ask them now, because HMRC did an estimate way back in the summer of 2012, I think, um, on the basis of the taxes being identical to the UK equivalents. Um, obviously, if HMRC had been doing the development, they would also have had to respond to the fact that there are differences now between the Scottish taxes and the UK taxes. Um, I, I have no idea what HMRC would, would be quoting at this point, um, but I, I think there is, a, I mean, at least a good chance that their costs might have gone up also in responding to, to the different design. But, but I can only speculate because we don't know now. 
So, yeah, right. But as far as you're concerned, you and HMRC both quoted on the same basis, as far as we're all aware. And uh, so it's not that you didn't quote correctly or anything. It's just that as things have developed, all these, these co extra costs have come in. And probably, as far as we know, they would also have come in on the HMRC side. Um, I mean, as far as we can tell, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the bulk of the additional cost is to do with making sure that the systems match the design of the, of the Scottish taxes. There, there is an element in this which is that my estimates have not turned out to be completely accurate. And that's, what I'm, you know, that, that's what I'm being honest about now. We've had to put more additional resource in to deliver. Um, but, but the bulk of the, of the difference between 16.7 and 21.2 is, is to do with making sure that the, that the design of the systems matches. Um, w the aspiration for Scotland. Appreciate the straightforward uh, answer. That's, that certainly helps me understand it. And I mean, within that remit as well, or within that area, that this whole question about the tax gap. I mean, you know, I suppose I do understand it, but it just seems a little bit odd that we start a new tax and immediately there's a tax gap. I mean, that to some people would make people think, well, you know, does that mean they're not doing their job properly? Because surely there shouldn't be a tax gap. Um. I, I would love to be in a world where um, you, you legislate and people are required to pay and all that Revenue Scotland has to do is just provide the system for the money to flow in the door. Um, but I don't think that's the world that any of us expect to be in. Um, there are, even with the tightening of the legislation, which this, as, uh, the Parliament has done for land and buildings transaction tax, um, and even with the, the powers given, I imagine that there will be an amount of testing, an amount of settling down, um, exploration of any grey areas or any um, room to manoeuvre. Um, I, w I am really not... I don't think we have a robust estimate of the tax gap. The four and a half million um, billion quoted is I mean, the best that we could do. Um, no, I mean, I, I totally accept... That's but uncertain. I, 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 it's not in the nature of tax that um, you simply put it out there and everybody pays it and there is nothing more to do. And obviously HMRC accept that because they are also, sorry, <coughs> let Mr Kenny come in, um, HMRC are also not just on this tax, but all taxes are mm -hmm. clearly are identifying this and trying to kind of eat into it as well. Did you want to say something, Mr Kenny? Yeah, I was going to say, <coughs> excuse me, but the legal waste sites within the for landfill that, sub that weren't previously subject to tax under the UK landfill tax scheme that are now subject to tax. They're illegal sites and by definition you might not know where they are. Now we've had sites individually that we've come across that would have had a seven figure tax liability. So we, 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 we know it's there and there's a gap there but it's difficult to it's, it's difficult to quantify because they're, Ill because they're illegal sites. Although we were finding them under the present or the past regime yep. every so often they turned up didn't they? They, they turned up and we're, and we're confident now with the resources we've been given that we'll be in a be better position to identify them and bring them into the, 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 the tax thing, but, but it's very hard to, to quantify them other than to say they're there and they're potentially large scale and, and, we're, and the, the, the beauty of this new tax and new system is that we can, we can go after that tax whereas we couldn't under the UK system. Okay. I mean, presumably with any tax gap, you spend a bit more, you get quite a lot more tax in. You spend a bit more, you don't get so much tax in. So there's a kind of balance in there. How, how do you judge what's the right balance? I, I think you, you will judge us on track record. So part of the reporting that we expect to have to do um, to the Parliament, to the public, is about how much money flowed in through the normal process of people doing returns and making their payments, and then how much money perhaps was collected as a result of further investigation work done by SEPA or by, by Revenue Scotland um, on either of the taxes. That the, and I think that's probably your best measure of how effective we're being. You'll understand how much we're spending on our compliance. You'll see how, much, how successful we're being. I do have to manage your expectations that you may not see that in the first six months because obviously there's a sort of a, a build-up of these things. You start the process of inquiries. You start taking action against people and it... But I would say over the first two, three years of the operation of these taxes, you would start to see how successful we are being in bringing that money in. And I would imagine that that's one of the things that you will want to be exploring with us regularly. So that was, if it was 230,000, I think was the figure, um, yeah. will you be able to identify how much tax you think that 230,000 has produced? 
Yeah, and over time. Over time, yes. yeah. Yes, over time, yeah, no, not immediately. Fair enough. Um, OK, Mr King, uh, your paper uh, it talked about your roles and responsibilities and they were quite uh, clear. And the fourth one, I, I, I wasn't sure I was understanding it, it said we have a role to play in the event that system contingency has to be invoked. The detail of this is being worked upon. Could you just explain what that, what that actually means? The system. So, if uh, in the event that there's a, a problem with the system, people aren't taxpayers aren't able to submit returns online. What would they do in that um, particular scenario? And we've been in discussion with Eleanor and our colleagues about the role that registers of Scotland would have to play in that, and simplifying the process for the the taxpayer. Um, Eleanor mentioned that um, paper returns, in general, will still be an option. Um, and how it's envisaged that will work is that paper returns will be sent in to registers of Scotland and we expect those returns to be sent to us along with um, what will essentially be paper applications for registration of the property transaction. So they'll come in potentially in the one envelope. And in terms of contingency, we're looking to, to extend that. And um, so if customers are used to sending paper returns to ROS, then in a contingency situation, they would continue to send a much wider or a much greater volume of paper returns to ROS as well. Yeah, that's helpful. I think contingency gets used in different ways by mm -hmm. different people. Uh, okay, thanks so much. Uh, thank you, uh, John. I just think uh, this this tax gap thing. I mean, you know, you, you say you'll be able to measure over time the impact of the two hundred thirty thousand pound and, and reducing the the gap, but but we don't even really know what the gap is. You're only really guessing that it's four and a half million, maybe three million, maybe six million. I mean, what about the impact of the general anti avoidance rules? I mean, surely they should reduce the tax gap quite substantially if not I'll virtually eliminate it. I mean I think issues like sub sale relief which were went through the bill, I mean that's more or less been eliminated. So I mean we're we're still trying to find what, where this tax gap could appear from. I I, th I think I don't personally find the term tax gap that helpful, but it's it's just it's in common usage. I, I, yes, I appreciate <laughs> I, I know I know <laughs> my own fault. Um, the the general anti avoidance rule is there to allow Revenue Scotland to take action to get the money in. It doesn't, sitting there of itself without any staff of Revenue Scotland or SEPA taking some action against a taxpayer, the general anti-avoidance rule won't achieve anything. So understand that the, the, these additional staff that I want to bring in will use the powers that the Parliament has given them in order to go after the money. So. It's not a tax gap as in you have legislated to leave a gap. It's a gap as in you have legislated. We expect that people's behaviour will not be that 100% of everything that should have come in will come in, and we will need to take action in order to tackle the bit that would otherwise not have come in using the powers that the Parliament has given. But that's quite interesting to me because you're basically saying you know you're going to spend an extra two hundred thirty thousand pounds to reduce this gap, because you said there's no point in having the effective rules if you've not got the people to enforce it. But surely, when you know when the original costings in terms of staff and what the staff had been needed for were were, were first um, uh, considered, then surely there must have been some consideration that this would be part of the staffing structure. You know that there would have to be a, a section for compliance. It's not just. That, oh, we need to, we've got these rules, we now need to bring in staff to try and uh, ensure compliance. I mean, I would have thought that would have been part of the whole structure from the off. Uh, and indeed it is. And there are other staff who will be doing compliance work within... So I, I have a... Th there is, there's a staffing structure. There will be people who will be doing compliance work. What, what, what I'm trying... The, the 230,000 was, was to allow us to, to have a conversation with the Parliament about... Um, It's about the, the net tax collected, if you like. So I could do this with, t take the, the three additional posts in Revenue Scotland out of the equation. Yes, of course, we would collect tax with 38 staff. Yes, of course, they would undertake some compliance work. Um, but we want, we, as the legislation has been developed and, and the draft legislation was introduced with the general anti-avoidance rule, we think that there's more action that we could take. And I therefore earmarked some additional posts to take further action on compliance um, and we will be able to explain what we will track this because we know it's of interest we will be able to explain what has has been achieved with those additional posts and it 
I mean, it, it's to allow, effectively, it's to allow the Parliament to ha have that choice of, you might in future scrutinise this and say, no, that we haven't demonstrated that it was worthwhile having those extra posts, and we would go back to having a structure with some basic compliance only. Alternatively, we might decide that this has been successful, it might be worth ramping the effort up. I mean, there are... I think it's difficult to, 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 given that we don't really know what the tax gap is or if it exists, you know, whether it's four and a half million or whatever, uh, I find it hard to see how you're going to be able to measure the impact of, of the additional compliance officers and reducing something if you don't know what it is. I mean, you could say next year, oh, it's three million quid, so these three people have reduced it by one and a half million, but they might not have, because it might not, there might not have been a four and a half million gap to start off with, you know? won't measure it that way. What I'll tell you about is what they've brought in, not whether mm -hmm. they've reduced a gap that I can't really estimate by an amount. So what we won't be able to say to you, we now know that the tax gap is some very precise number and it has mm. come down by some very precise number. What we will be able to tell you is the actions of the additional compliance officers have brought in a certain amount of additional tax revenue or they're on track to do so if we're looking at the very early stages. Um, which is, is why, I, I, uh, with hindsight, it might not have been the best way to cast this in terms of the tax gap. It's a term in common usage. We, we should probably have re really related this back to action to make sure that all the tax is paid and that you would see an increase in tax take as a result of the work that these people would do. Okay. I, I don't know if that helps. Um, no, really. Mal <laughs> <laughs> I'll just ask you about something more general. I may be missing something here, but in your section uh, called Revenue Scotland Staffing, you say that there's two divisions with around 40 staff, and then you go on to say um, um, we've agreed the anticipating future staffing structure, and we're going. To, we're currently completing the detailed planning and preparation for the recruitment of 41 staff. So I'm, I'm just a bit confused here. Is this? Um, uh, what's the total number going to be at the end of that recruitment phase? Are these just... Uh, anyway, you can see the point I'm making. Are these different people? Or are the other, other people going to go and do something else once the other people have come in, or what? Most of them, yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we've got a team of 40 um, who are doing the setup work, effectively. And we have designed a staffing structure for Go Live with 41 posts. A small number of people, I think currently four or possibly five, are going to move from the, um, the set-up team into operational posts eventually. Um, but th the others who are involved in the setup will, as their work comes to an end, leave. Um, and we'll, meanwhile, be building up the, the operational team of 41. So at the peak, which would probably be around... Um, February, March time, we will have a lot more than 41 because we'll have people who are still finishing setup work and we will have people coming in ready to do the operational work. And then it will, one team will dwindle to zero and the other team will, will build up. People from other parts of the civil service or is it open advertisements and such like? In the, in the meantime, we're only looking within the civil service, but right. we yeah. are potentially looking beyond Scottish government because we, may, we want some people with tax experience. Right. And will, will those numbers... When it comes to 2016, will you have to increase further at that stage, or you, when the full sort of Scotland Act um, provisions have kicked in? Um, we don't anticipate anything any further increase based on the 2012 Act no, okay. because no. uh, Scottish rate of income tax will not impact on right, okay. on Revenue no, Scotland. No. Um, obviously, if there are any further powers to come, there will be further setup work to do, and there will be whatever impact that winds up having mm -hmm. on operational staffing okay. structure, but, but nothing on the existing mm -hmm. plan. So in general, in terms of your table, um, the budget's declining significantly between 1415 and 1516, is that, is that right? Um, yes, um, that's right. Uh, oh. I've got... Um, I've currently got around... Um, uh, Sorry, I'm just trying to read the right figure. So I've got at least £600,000 worth of set-up costs um, for Revenue Scotland um, and a bit more than that in terms of IT set-up running into 2015-16, um, but that would drop away 
on the current plan if there's no further taxes to set up. And in terms of funding allocated to Sea Power Registers of Scotland, is, is that, uh, has we got a figure for that or? Uh, uh -huh. in terms of set up or I mean the, the, no, in terms of fifteen sixteen once it's in fifteen one, uh, uh -huh. sixteen costs are, are projected fairly steady. Do you want to yeah. comment <coughs> on the, the five five the five nine five to six hundred thousand okay. and registers of Scotland is that much? Yeah, we're yeah. predicting a, a running cost of in the region of three hundred and twenty five thousand. Mm. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um well, it's just uh, the allocation for 2015-16 has been reduced from 40 million to 25.7 million. It's partly explained by the transfer of 4.3 million to a new budget line for Revenue Scotland. Just wonder if you could explain what that budget line is. Um, that that is Revenue Scotland's budget and the budget to pay for um, for uh, Ross and for SEPA for their the the costs of operating the taxes in 15-16. Uh, up, up to now, we've operated with, with these costs being paid from within the 2012 Act implementation budget, but obviously from April, you have an independent body, so it needs its own budget line. So that's mm -hmm. why the transfer out. OK, that's fine. OK, that appears to have exhausted all the questions from members of the committee. Is there any further points you wish to make on any issues that we may not have touched upon? OK, well, thank you very much. Uh, that being the end of um, the deliberations today, I will call the committee to an end. Thank you, everyone.